All right, let's dive deep into Taoism today. Sounds good to me. We're going to be looking at chapter 25 of the Tao Te Ching. Oh, excellent choice. It's a text that really gets at, like, the core of existence, mm -hmm. you know, our place in the cosmos and all that. Yeah, it's a big one. We've got some great sources to help us unpack it all. Okay, what are we working with? We've got this really insightful lecture by Tao Master Cho Meng Fu. Oh, I like him. He's got such a clear way of explaining things. Yeah, and we'll also be breaking down chapter 25 itself. Nice. You know, looking at the original text and the mm -hmm. translation. Mm -hmm and even pulling in some real world examples to illustrate the concepts. Love that, makes it so much more relatable. Right, so our mission today is to help you guys really grasp the core principles of this chapter. Okay. See how they stack up against some Western philosophical ideas. Interesting. And ultimately like explore how these insights can help us create a more peaceful and harmonious world. Ambitious, but I'm in, where do we start? Well, I think a good place to begin is with Tao Master Chu's description of the Tao itself. Yeah, that's always a good foundation. He paints this like vivid picture of something born from chaos, right? Okay. Existing before heaven and earth, a silent, boundless force ever flowing. I love that imagery. He even calls it the mother of all things. Yeah, it's powerful, right? It is. And it's interesting because, you know, this idea of the Tao being born from chaos kind of echoes some ideas in modern cosmology. Oh. How so? Well, think about the Big Bang Theory, right? Okay. The universe exploding into existence from this state of pure energy. Yeah. There's a parallel there. Hmm, I see that. A connection between these ancient ideas and modern science. So chapter 25 itself describes the Tao as undefined and complete. Yeah. Like something that transcends our typical ways of thinking. It's not a thing, really. More yeah. like the potential for all things. You can't quite grasp it, but it's the source of everything. Exactly. It's like trying to catch water in your hand. You can't hold it, but it's essential for life. So even naming the Tao is a problem. Even Lousy himself admits he doesn't know its true name. Wow, so the author of the Tao Te Ching struggles with it too. Yeah, yeah, it's that inherent mystery that makes it so intriguing. This constant invitation to explore, to go deeper. Yeah, absolutely, to question everything. Okay, so we've got this idea of the Tao that's elusive force. Yeah. Now chapter 25 also talks about this hierarchy. Right. The four greats, it calls them. Right. What are they? We've got the Tao, obviously. Mm -hmm. Then heaven, earth, and the king. Interesting. Which we can kind of think of as like the ideal ruler or leader. I see. So it's tempting to think of this hierarchy as like a pyramid of power. Right. With the Tao dictating everything below it. Exactly. But the Taoist view is much more nuanced than that. Oh, in what way? It's not about one thing dominating another. Okay. It's more about this natural order, like an ecosystem. Mm. Okay. Everything interconnected, each element relying on the one before it. So each element has its place and contributes to the overall harmony. Precisely. A very different way of seeing the world than some Western philosophies that focus on power structures. This reminds me of a few concepts in Western philosophy, though. Oh, tell me more. Well, think about Plato's idea of the form of the good, for example. All right, the ultimate source of truth and beauty. Exactly. Kind of like the Tao in that way. Right. But the key difference is how we relate to this ultimate principle. So Plato believed we could understand the form of the good through reason. Yeah. But the Tao is ultimately unknowable. It's a mystery. Something to be experienced rather than defined. Exactly. We surrender to it instead of trying to conquer it with our intellect. Okay. So we've got the Tao and this hierarchy of the four greats. Mm -hmm. But where do we as humans fit into all of this? Well, chapter 25 lays out this beautiful flow. Oh, okay, I'm intrigued. It says, man takes his law from the earth, the earth takes its law from heaven, heaven takes its law from the Tao, and the Tao follows what is natural. Whoa, that's like a cosmic chain of command. It is, but again, not in a domineering way. Right. It's more about recognizing the interdependence of everything. To illustrate this, Tao Master Cho uses this great analogy. Oh, I love his analogy. He talks about how we depend on the earth for food, the earth relies on heaven for sunlight and rain, mm. and heaven, of course, follows the Tao, this ultimate natural order. So simple, but it really captures that interconnectedness, doesn't it? It does. It makes you realize how much we're part of this web of existence, not separate from nature at all. We rely on the earth, just like everything else. So how can we understand our place in this natural order better? That's the million dollar question. What does it mean to live in accordance with the earth, with heaven, and ultimately with the Tao? 
Those are questions worth pondering. Yeah, they really get to the heart of what this chapter is all about. Absolutely. Makes you think about how we should live and how we organize our societies. Big implications. You know, this whole concept of natural order reminds me of something from Western thought. Oh, what's that? The great chain of being. Ah, yes, that idea from medieval Europe. Where everything has its place in this hierarchy leading up to God. Similar structure. Right, but the tone is very different. The great chain of being often emphasizes striving upward. But Taoism is more about finding harmony within the flow. So not about dominating or controlling. More about understanding our place and acting in accordance with that. Working with the grain of the universe. Exactly. And I think that's so relevant to the challenges we face today. Yeah. Environmental issues, social conflicts. If we could shift from domination to harmony. It could have a huge impact on how we approach everything. It really could. Which brings us to another important question. What's that? How do these Taoist principles translate into action? How do we use them to build a more peaceful and harmonious world? That's what we'll explore next. I'm ready. Let's dive in. All right, let's do it. Well, chapter 25 doesn't give us like a step-by-step -step plan or anything. Right. But it does offer insights into what a peaceful and harmonious world could look like. Okay. And the principles that might get us there. So no 10-point plan, no. but more of a philosophical framework. Exactly. And it really boils down to this concept of naturalness. Okay, naturalness. Or Ziran in Chinese. Ziran. Yeah, think of it like this. Okay. In nature, things tend to find a balance, right? Right. Ecosystems adapt, rivers carve their paths, forests regenerate after fires. Mm -hmm. Ziran is about aligning with that natural flow. Okay, so it's about recognizing that just like nature finds its balance, human society can too. Exactly. So instead of forcing things, yeah. we work with the natural patterns of the universe. Precisely. And that has implications for everything. Everything. From how we govern ourselves to how we relate to each other and the environment. So how does naturalness apply to something like leadership? Oh, good question. We were talking about the king, the ideal ruler before. Yeah, right. How would they embody naturalness? Well, chapter 25 suggests they wouldn't rule through force or control. But by cultivating the conditions for harmony and prosperity to, to emerge naturally. Like a gardener. Yeah, exactly. Nurturing the plants without trying to control every aspect of their growth. Perfect analogy. It's about creating an environment where people can thrive. Okay. Where their talents can blossom without being stifled by rigid rules or structures. It sounds kind of like a blueprint for a less hierarchical way of organizing ourselves. Hmm. There's definitely an element of that in Taoist thought. Hmm. The emphasis on minimal interference points towards a system that's more organic, more responsive. So more decentralized, more bottom up. You could say that. And it connects with some contemporary thinkers too. Oh yeah. Who are yeah. advocating for these more localized, community-based models of governance. Makes sense. Those ideas definitely resonate with chapter 25. Okay, so we've talked about leadership. Hmm? What about our individual roles in all this? How do we, as individuals, contribute to this harmonious world? Exactly. Well, it comes back to aligning ourselves with the Tao, with the natural flow. And that starts with understanding our interconnectedness with all of life. Right, our actions have consequences. Not just for us, but for the whole web of existence. Like that agricultural analogy? Yes. We depend on the earth, the earth on heaven, heaven on the dale. That interconnected dance. Exactly. And when we truly grasp that, it leads to a sense of responsibility. Mm. Our well-being is tied to the well-being of everything else. It's an ecological worldview, seeing ourselves as part of a larger ecosystem. You got it. And that's incredibly relevant today, given our environmental challenges. Right. If we see ourselves as separate from nature, yeah. entitled to exploit it without consequence. It's a recipe for disaster. But if we understand our interconnectedness, we naturally make different choices. And those choices are reflected in the values that chapter 25 emphasizes. Which are? Humility, non-contention, simplicity, living in accordance with our true nature. Those are the qualities we need to cultivate. If we want a more harmonious and sustainable world. Absolutely. And these aren't just abstract ideals. No. They have practical implications for how we live, how we consume, how we interact. So we're bringing these principles down to earth. Exactly. Integrating them into our daily lives. That's where the real transformation begins. Now, both Chapter 25 and Tao Master Che emphasize this idea of building a world rich in diversity. Mm -hmm. How does that fit into this vision of harmony and peace? Well, the chapter recognizes that the universe is full of diverse beings. 
Okay. Each with its unique qualities. So it doesn't see this diversity as a source of conflict? No, it sees it as a source of strength and beauty. Instead of forcing everyone into the same mold. We celebrate those differences and see them as essential to the overall harmony. Like a forest. Exactly. It thrives because of the diversity of its inhabitants. Each species plays a role in maintaining the balance. It's like a tapestry, yeah. woven together from countless different threads. Beautiful image, it highlights that a truly harmonious world embraces diversity. And Dalmaster Cho talked about this too. He did. He sees diversity as a source of joy and connection leading to a world of smiling faces. That's a vision worth striving for. It is, especially in a world that often feels so divided. So celebrating diversity isn't just about tolerance. It's about recognizing the inherent value of different perspectives, different ways of being. And creating spaces where those perspectives can be heard and respected. And integrated into decision making. Building a world where everyone feels a sense of belonging where everyone can contribute their unique gifts. This brings me to another key theme in chapter 25. What's that? Happiness. Oh, yeah. How does that fit into this vision of a harmonious and diverse world? Well, in the West, happiness is often seen as something external. Right, something we achieve by acquiring things. Possessions, status, pleasure. But the Taoist view is different. Very different. It's about aligning with the natural flow, living in accordance with the Tao. Exactly, happiness isn't pursued. It just arises. Naturally, when we're in alignment with the Tao. When we're living in harmony with the natural order, precisely. It's not about chasing happiness. It's about cultivating the conditions for happiness to emerge. And those conditions are rooted in the principles we've been talking about. Interconnectedness, humility. Non-contention, simplicity, respect for nature. When we embody these values, happiness becomes a natural byproduct. It challenges our usual assumptions about happiness. It really does. It suggests it's not something we have to strive for. But something that emerges when we live a certain way. And that way of living isn't about deprivation. No. It's about finding joy in the simple things, connection, relationships. Contentment and gratitude. Instead of constantly wanting more. It sounds liberating. It is. Letting go of that chase and allowing happiness to arise naturally. And it connects with contemporary ideas about mindfulness too. Absolutely. Being present, appreciating the moment. So embracing this Taoist view of happiness could benefit not just us, but the world as a whole. Right. When we're content and at peace, we're less likely to engage in conflict, to harm others or the environment. It's like a ripple effect of peace and joy. Beautiful. And it emphasizes that interconnectedness again. Our inner state is reflected in the world around us. Where are we inseparable? So chapter 25 offers this vision of a world that's peaceful, harmonious, diverse, and happy. A vision grounded in the principles of the Tao. In the natural flow of the universe. And it's a vision we can all contribute to making a reality. But where do we even begin? That's the next step in our journey. What are some concrete actions we can take? Let's explore that. Yeah, it can feel overwhelming, right? Like, how do we change the world? It's a big task. But that's where that Taoist principle comes in. Which one? Focusing on what we can control. Oh, right. Aligning with the flow, not forcing things. Exactly. So maybe instead of tackling these huge issues all at once, yeah. we start with our own lives, I... our own little corner of the world. Each of us can embody these principles in our everyday actions, our choices. Right, the little thing. Is... It's those small, consistent actions that ripple outwards. So like instead of getting into arguments online, mm -hmm. we approach those conversations with more understanding and empathy. Yeah. Or maybe we support local businesses that are sustainable. Right. Instead of those giant corporations that prioritize profit above all else. Exactly. It's about making choices that reflect our values. Contributing to the kind of world we want to see. Right. It's also about cultivating those inner qualities. Yes. Humility, non-contention, simplicity. The more we embody those within ourselves, yeah. the more peace and harmony we radiate outwards. So we become the change we want to see. Exactly, not waiting for someone else to fix things. And trust that even small actions can have a big impact. Think about a tiny seed. Okay. It can grow into a mighty tree. So how do we nurture those seeds of change? What are some practical steps? Well, one powerful practice is mindfulness. Okay, being present. Paying attention to the present moment, our thoughts, feelings, actions. Without judgment. Exactly. It helps us become more aware of how our choices impact us and others. I like that emphasis on non-judgment. Yeah. It's so easy to get caught up in self-criticism or blame. It is. But mindfulness creates a more compassionate inner environment. 
And from that space of awareness, yeah. we can make more conscious choices, choices that align with our values. They contribute to the well-being of everyone. Exactly. Dial Master Chow also talked about connection and friendship. Oh, yes. How do those fit into this vision of a harmonious world? They're essential. Chapter 25 reminds us we're all interconnected. Part of that web of life. And when we nurture those connections, cultivate genuine friendships, mm -hmm. it strengthens the fabric of society. He talked about building a world of smiling faces yes. and deep connections where kindness and understanding are the norm. It's a beautiful vision. It highlights the power of human connection. To heal divisions, create a more compassionate world. Right, so it's not just about abstract principles. It's about reaching out. Building bridges. Registering community. Recognizing our shared humanity. Celebrating the diversity that makes life so rich. And remembering we're not alone on this journey. There are others who share this vision. We can draw strength and inspiration from each other. Support each other, learn from each other. Celebrate each other's successes. Because every step towards a more harmonious world is worth celebrating. Absolutely. It's like we're weaving this tapestry of peace and harmony together. One thread at a time. Even though the challenges seem daunting. They can be. We have the power to create a different future. A future aligned with the wisdom of the Tao. With the natural flow of the universe. It's not about waiting for someone else to fix things. It's about taking responsibility. Cultivating those qualities. Trusting that small steps can make a big difference. You said it perfectly. Well, I think that wraps up our deep dive into chapter 25. It does. We've explored its insights into existence, our place in the universe, mm. and the path towards a world that's peaceful, harmonious, diverse, and happy. A truly enriching conversation. I hope it sparked your curiosity. I hope so and left you feeling inspired. Me too. Remember, even small actions can make a big difference. Don't underestimate the power of small things. Cultivate those qualities of humility, non-contention, simplicity, interconnectedness. Yes. Nurture your connections, celebrate diversity. And trust in the wisdom of the Tao. Until next time, may you find peace and happiness in the natural flow of the universe. Thank you.